Okay, thank you. So what I'm going to do today is um, talk... about, I suppose, the flip side, the t two very different um, uh, components of working within the Asian-Australian context. Um, uh, you know, I've been involved in, in the, looking at this relationship between Australia and Asia for over, over a decade, and within that time, we've seen, I've seen quite significant shifts about how this uh, conversation has developed. And this, I think, is applicable to not just to conversations around Australia's relationship to, with Asia, but also thinking about the types of politics which are involved in uh, definitions of place. So, um, you know, there are two different sides to this, to this conversation. On one hand, we consider that there is a soft diplomatic um, context, that, that there is some, the drivers to Asia are economic and, um, you know, that there is a diplomatic benefit which emerges from it. And then on the other side, we have conversations around the transformative nature of transcultural conversations, how that they actually are able to shift the ways in which we think, the, way that we define, the ways in which we define ourselves, and the types of conversations that we, that, that we are having. So I've got a slide here of Yuk King Tan, which she's um, was actually born in Australia, I think, then lived for a long time in New Zealand before moving to, to Hong Kong. So the, this work is called um, Island Portrait. It's had a few uh, name changes since I first came across it in 2004. It effectively is a portrait of um, an engineering company who had gifted to Rarotonga its uh, courthouse. So the place where, um, you know, a, a really potent symbol of, of democracy, of um, also of self-determination, which had been gifted by a foreign power. And as I, as I um, go through my paper, you can read one of the artist statements that, is, that comes with it. So there is a duality between politics and experimental, pra and experimental and art, um, between the politics and experimental artistic practice. Reminds me of some writings from artists from recent times when similarly different intellectual traditions began to interface with established institutional positions and frameworks. In 1989, in the same year as his seminal presentation in the exhibitions of Les Magicians de la Terre, the artist Wang Yongping wrote an essay, Art, Power, Discourse, where he talks about the relationship between individual freedoms and the creation, of transmission, the creation and transmission of art through a range of agents, including the artist, the exhibition, and the art world. The various expectations for artists to speak and to perform within the closed format of, it, of the exhibition to Huang represents a kind of deficiency where the coexistence of artistic liberation or avant-gardism is in reality a closed situation. So in the same way that freedom exists within unfree situations. So what I'm saying here is that um, there is artists want to, be, want to be as independent and um, experimental as they'd like to be, but there are always constraints on, in terms of how that they're presented or how that they perform for the world. Huang's writings remind me that the formulation of what the international means is a discourse of power. Within it, apparitions of the art historian, the dealer, the museum, collector, and the modish artist take shape often in, seri in, in superior positions to the local, the grassroots, and the regional. A couple of years ago, Kate Fowl, who was then the director of the Independent Curators International, an organization based in New York, came to Melbourne and Sydney, and she hosted two wide-ranging conversations about what international, the international might mean in an Australian context. On one hand, there was a, a predictable genealogy of exhibitions from the 1968 field, uh, and this conversation came from Melbourne. And, um, and, you know, this is a particular narrative arc of Australia's relationship to the international. 
Another less straightforward version emerged in a conversation in Sydney, which really encapsulated an, anxi an anxiety around Australia's locality, its immediate ge geography and climate, histories of colonisation, migration, and the broader history of the immediate Asia-Pacific region. Its archetype was the curmudgeonly anachronistic Ian Fairweather, an Englishman who adopted by Australian art history, who, distrust, who distrusted polite society as much as he hated authority. Instead of answering the question, what is international, what does the international look like, our group seemed to be asking instead, what is the value of being independent? As a way to acknowledge the inherent and messy hierarchies of nation, Eurocentrism and heteronormality, which I think really embodies that other narrative arc of Australian, Australia's relationship to the, to the world. And, you know, the, these two situations, I mean, then we can think back at what um, Huang Yongping was saying before, is that, that the art world really is a closed situation. The usage of the word international as both noun and also proper noun in the art world seems to be changing. Where once the international was a shorthand for an aesthetics and politics emerging from Western Europe and North America, it has shifted in usage to maybe just mean somewhere else. And so where once demarcations between the local, regional and the international were distinct and defined, in popular parlance, I don't think that this is, I think this is no longer the case. The ease by which governments and their bureaucracies turn on and off different international priorities in the service of soft diplomacy is a case in point. Um, and, you know, this, this type of, of diplomacy is a driver for a particular kind of, of uh, international interactivity. In these contexts, artists and culture are the grease that lubricates discussions of economy to facilitate the culture of business. Culture and the work of artists, curators, critics and organisations are hardly recognisable as something valuable with their own traditions and contradictions, hardly acknowledged as being generative of different kinds of thinking, ethics and aesthetics. And, you know, they're hardly acknowledged as reflecting the histories of the particular places from which they emerge. In the past, people have imagined different versions of what a future cultural life looks like. And they've imagined how it interacts with other places and how through art our social hierarchies might change for the better. This, of course, is true, especially when we look at artists and organisations who avail themselves of knowledge and understanding of things going on elsewhere and whose work emerges from a social context or who respond to the pressures of social and political life. But the corollary is also true, that our governments and their bureaucracies and institutions are governed sometimes by outdated attitudes and understandings of history and geography, and these influence the kinds of narratives of elsewhere. As a nation geographically and politically situated between Asia and the West, society, culture and politics in Australia for most of its modern period has been governed by the white, white Australia policy. A repressive policy enacted through the first legislation which passed through the uh, federal parliament, the Restriction of Immigration Act. Deliberately it was the first act. Um, as a way, uh, white Australia emerged in spite of ongoing experiences of intercultural relationships formed through historic trading and migration histories, regional experiences of colonisation, enforced labour, which often coincided with and sometimes predated the colonisation of Australia at the end of the 18th century. So what I'm wanting to do in a really short time is kind of map out the, the different ways in which uh, terminology like um, Asian Australia or the relationship between Asia and Australia has shifted since um, the end of the white Australia policy in around the 1980s. So when we move to, towards the 1980s and 1990s, we see terminology um, like Asian Australian or Chinese Australian, Indonesian Australian, etc. And these um, uh, these phrases have been used to position artists of Asian background, and when we uh, is, and its usage can be seen to not only reflect Australia's acknowledgement of its multicultural makeup, um, 
but also when it's used by people of Asian background in this period as a desire for greater recognition of the historical experience and also for political parity. So in the 1980s and 90s when this terminology began to, to um, have some use, it, it was a highly political term and so therefore, and also it's a highly vexed uh, terminology now as a kind of um, approximate indicator of, of Asian culture in Australia. Since at least the 1980s, the language of cross-cultural cross engagement has been driven by this multicultural politics. Um, and it's been used to bridge, to cross, and to engage new and diverse audiences. Developing within this period uh, um, the, um, has been the burgeoning uh, has, has been economic priorities, I suppose, driven by China's burgeoning economic power. And so what we see is a shift from a response to the kind of um, cultural context of Australia to one which looks externally, to one which seeks to grapple with, with uh, new markets and um, new eco economic imperatives. So one hand, in the, in the 80s we, and 90s, we see um, a cross-cultural encounter which is based on a desire to reorder a kind of national framework. So in this context, Asian Australian artists are seen to illustrate Australian culture as multicultural, outward-looking, and different from the national character of previous decades. Artists of Chinese backgrounds such as A Shen, Guan Wei, Lindy Lee, and William Yam came to represent a core of these artists. But in the mid, from the, about the mid-2000s, artists like Guan Wei, Guo Jian, and Wang Juyun, mostly the post Tiananmen Square uh, generation of artists, began to leave Australia to pursue interests in China. And so I think that this also illustrates the fragility of some of the um, kind of framework around, uh, around um, the around this discourse. That you know there there is not. When, we t when we're talking about um, place and, and Australia's place in the region, we're not only just talking about um, our own cultural context, but we're also talking about uh, economics. But in the art world, there is an increased awareness of contemporary Asian art. New collections are emerging. There are new powerhouses and different players. But the reality is that this is a continuation of work which is being done by a f in the field by artists, curators, art historians, critics, collectors, small organizations, publishers and magazines, and also big institutions for decades. What I believe that is happening now is the changing context for contemporary art, not a narrowing, narrowing of its reference, but a larger global appreciation for the kinds of influences and trajectories that artists have been availing themselves for some time. The large institutions in the traditional centres like New York and also in London have been recently developing capacity within the Asian art context. They're doing so not at the expense of their traditional areas of collection, but presumably because there's a growing body, a discourse that has emerged over decades of work, which has influenced not only their own immediate artistic geographies, but communities of artists and critics the world over. And when we examine the biennales that we think are valuable or influential, Asian art is presented or discussed not as a kind of ethnographic type, but as valuable as an art that is illustrative of the wider web of artistic influences and conversations that, that a global web of conversations and influences produces. What I'm suggesting here is that, that within, the me within the mechanics of politics and economics, which is framed in recent interest in Asian culture, the role of the artist, the critic, the curator, and the organization helps to produce the discourse and knowledge which refigures these things in much more interesting and strategic ways. So June Yap, who recently created a, a really big touring exhibition uh, supported by the Guggenheim, um, describes the si her situation in much more prosaic terms, in everyday terms, when she describes the demarcation of Eastern and Western art as simply being idealistic in, its in their assumption of complete isolation. The experience in life itself is fluid and permeable, and that her own experience of growing up in Singapore with a combination of local history and culture regional and British literature, American television, and later 
adding to the blend Eastern European texts and different philosophies, which are both Eastern and Western. She never sees herself as being toggling between Asian and non-Asian, but simply tr trying to articulate the world as she knows it. I think that that was... I've got a... So I, I suppose what I'm... What, what I've tried to illustrate is that there are indeed different drivers for um, our engagement with Asia. One of them is local. One of them is actually about trying to understand the, the history of, of our local places. And the other one is, is also economic, uh, which is tied up within, within national institutions and within uh, the policies of our governments. But there is a way through uh, manu curatorially maneuvering and artistically maneuvering through these spaces to create situations of meaning, uh, which are meaningful situations uh, driven by artists on the ground. That's all I have time for. Thank you. Thank you.